Welcome to The Writer's Dream. Our show is a forum where writers can talk about their books, how they write them, how they publish them, and how they market them. Uh, you can see our show on YouTube. It's called The Writer's Dream. You can see us on Facebook. Our page is called The Writer's Dream. If you have any questions for our authors or for me about the show, about being on the show, about what we do, uh, please uh, post those questions on the Facebook page, The Writer's Dream, and I'll try to answer them. Today's guest is Russ Moran. Russ is the author of his latest book, The Gray Ship, which is a uh, novel, and he is also the author of Justice in America, How It Works, and the APT Principle, the business plan that can, that can carry, <laughs> that you carry in your head, I'm sorry. Um, the, the APT Principle is not here today, but Justice in America is, so Russ, which book would you like to start with? Oh, I'd love to talk about you The Great Ship. You prolific my favorite, writer, you. <laughs> my favorite book. <laughs> OK, go right ahead. Well, um, uh, this is a book about the uh, science fiction subgenre of time travel and alternative history. Um, I think it's a very fun genre. Uh, mm. I had a ball writing it. This was my first novel. And when I began this, I knew nothing about writing fiction. I, didn't, I knew that dialogue meant two people talking to one another, and what they say is in quotes, but that's about as far as it went. The uh, uh, actual uh, arranging of it is something that I had to learn as I went along. Um, uh, the project began, like most of my projects, uh, in a conversation with my wife, Linda. Um, she's been after me for years to write a novel. I mean, I've been writing all my life. I used to be a, a legal publisher and a journalist. And um, hence, Justice in America is my book on law for the layperson. But I've never written uh, fiction. Mm -hmm. And she said, look, you've got to write a novel. You love to write. So uh, we just started kicking it around. She says, well, what do you know? She says, you were in the Navy. You love ships. You love boats. So I said, yeah, I know something about that. And she says, also, you like history. Uh, I'm a Civil War buff. So all of a sudden, as we're chatting, I said, hmm. How about a modern nuclear warship travels through time and winds up just before the Civil War? And then a few days later, I said, well, how about, you know, the great question that you pose to yourself as an author is, what if? What if? Well, what if the captain was a woman? What if the captain is a young African-American woman in the Civil War? So all of a sudden, the novel started to build tension without my even starting it. So, but it starts, she's the captain of the nuclear sub, and then she time travels it's a, it's as a, an African-American woman back to the Civil War. Yeah, it's a guided missile cruiser. Okay. Um, <laughs> that actually existed in history. Um, it's the USS California, and she's the commanding officer. Uh, some people have commented that this is impossible, you to, that this is unrealistic, and to them I only say, well, there have been five African-American women admirals so that part wasn't radical. The radical part is when they went through this time portal or wormhole and they wound up before the Civil War. Uh, not too many uh, African-American sea captains in the Civil War. <clears throat> no. No. <laughs> as, as Captain Ashley Patterson put it, she said, colored girls in uniform tend to create a stir in the 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> And she you, you actually used the term colored girls. That's huh? what that's how yeah. Captain Patterson recognized that that's how they referred to um, African Americans in the 19th century. So your main character is Ashley Patterson. Mm -hmm. and, um, okay, I have a question for you because of my science background. How did you treat the time travel? And what kind of research did you have to do to make it, like, you know, authentic? What happened, and, and I'm not really giving away too much of the book because it happens no, don't in the do that. first chapter, <laughs> um, they experience a very strange bumping. Uh, the ship is rocking. It feels like they're going over a herd of whales. And all of a sudden, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and suddenly the sky is bright daylight. It's a beautiful day, but where'd the sun come from? Uh, and... Shortly after that, the darkness returns, and, and then as the book unfolds, they gradually, slowly realize that they didn't just go through a strange anomaly, they're actually in a different century. So they went from 2013 to 1861 
in a matter of moments. Um, as far as researching that, time travel is uh, one of the fun things about the genre mm -hmm. is there are no firm rules. Some people believe there are strict rules. Um, Stephen King's book, uh, 1120, uh, 1122-63, about the, ultimately the Kennedy assassination. Yes, I read that. Fun book. Yes. And uh, he had a guy stepping over a threshold mm -hmm. at, the, uh, at, uh, at a diner, and that was his time. Yeah, that I just <laughs> also finished two books by uh, Diane Harkness. Uh, uh, they're about witches, and <clears throat> there's time travel in there, and they do the same thing. They have to take objects with them from that other time, <clears throat> and they have to step. They, ha and, you know, it's 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 not really, from my way of thinking, from a scientific point of view, very well explained. But I did really like the idea <laughs> that they held hands and stepped into <laughs> another century. That's so exciting. Important thing to understand that it's make believe. Yes. Uh, time travel, uh, from my research, it is a scientific possibility. Sure. Um, but it's make-believe. <laughs> it's a practical impossibility. Which was the book uh, <clears throat> that was uh, written by Michael Crichton, where he, they time travel back into uh, medieval uh, yeah. France, uh, into the Dordogne. I can't remember the name of the book, but that was also the <clears throat> same idea. But the scientist involved, because Crichton is always very good with his science research, it all had to do with quantum theory and disintegration and in reintegration. And uh, <clears throat> that, that was pretty interesting as well. But, you know, I have friends in my book club who um, they always want to read – let me put it this way. They never really want to read books like Time Travel and stuff like that. Because you have to suspend reality. In order to enjoy these books, you have to imagine the impossible. You know, that, that reminds me, something that impressed me as, as a young man, uh, and I was not a writer then, but I was watching the, uh, that Sunday evening Walt Disney show, not the Mickey Mouse Club, they, they, Disney Presents or yes, something like yes, that. It was back I, in the I 50s. Remember it. I remember and it well. uh, he actually had a segment, uh, Walt Disney himself, where he discussed the plausible impossible. I'll never forget that because when you're reading something like time travel or I guess science fiction in general, but there are no monsters or zombies or anything in this book, you buy the premise and you're into the story. Sure. If you, you buy the essential premise that this ship did pass through a wormhole and it's now 152 years in the past, once you buy that, then it has to be plausible going forward. Mm -hmm. It's like if the um, a coyote is chase, uh, chasing the roadrunner off the edge of a cliff and the roadrunner goes beep beep and he jumps up and the coyote runs off the cliff and he looks down and he's suspended there, and then he falls. Well, that's impossible. He would have fallen immediately, but it's plausible because at least he fell down. If he ran off the cliff and fell upward, that wouldn't even be plausible. So you buy the premise that the, the coyote hung there for a while, and then you, know, the, then you can laugh your way through the rest of the cartoon. Well, time, uh, time travel, I think, in a book allows you to really enrich the, the surroundings, the environment, uh, the problems that characters face in books are generally, no matter when they are, whether it's the time of the cave people or in the future, problems are always the same. They're always having to solve something having to do with survival. So, um, and I often think of that about Stephen King. I have arguments with my friends about Stephen King. I think he's a great writer and I love his books and I'm always mesmerized by them. And they say, why? You really believe in vampires and monsters and stuff? And I said, no, it's the characters. He, ca he captures me with the characters. They're so sympathetic, and they have to solve these problems, and I always want to find out what happens to them. Mm -hmm. And his son, too. I read uh, Joe Hill uh, change his name from King to Hill because he didn't want to be known as, well, sure. as, as, his, as his old man's son, uh, and uh, a book called Horns. And I thought it was terrific. And you really had to suspend a lot of belief. Uh, yeah. This guy turns into a devil and he's got horns. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he's such a rich character. That's right. Uh, you, were, you were right uh, there with him. Well, Anne Rice and the, the vampire, the Lestat series. I mean, <clears throat> I, I, I'm not a fan of vampires. They kind of scare me. But, but you know, the, the characters are rich and they just draw you in. So mm -hmm. that's what you have to do with <clears throat> this. But um, wh what can you tell us about the plot without giving too much away? Well, here are these people, and they're suddenly, they, it, it finally dawns on them that, hey, uh, we're in a different time. 
this is no longer 2013. They finally gathered enough evidence. They were going toward Charleston, South Carolina, to Fort Sumter for the, hundred, the annual, uh, this was the 152nd anniversary of the attack on Fort Sumter. And that's, as they were going toward Charleston, um, that's when they encountered the wormhole. Mm -hmm. And they noticed, among the many things they noticed, that the Charleston waterfront is totally different from recent photographs. One of the characters in the book um, had visited his cousin in Charleston five months before. And he said, what happened to that beautiful bridge? They have this Cooper River Bridge. It's the most popular thing in Charleston. And it isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. So all of this evidence starts to build up. And they finally decide, hey, this, this isn't Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> OK, so that's, uh, that is an interesting premise. So um, who inspired your characters? Some people that I know. Um, some people that I know from history, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Gideon Wells, the Secretary of the Navy mm -hmm. in Lincoln's administration. And um, that was the most amazing thing for me as a, as a first time novelist. How uh, I felt, okay, so you do a novel, so you, 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 know, you, you make a lot of stuff up. But, and I've read other people say this, I've read Stephen King say this, and it, uh, it's one of the fun parts of writing fiction, I'm sure you'll agree. Well, the characters start to take over. Um, at one point, it was, I, I cracked up laughing at my own thoughts. I'm thinking of President Lincoln. I'm thinking, what a great idea. No, he's a great man. It's like, oh, that was really Lincoln's idea. <laughs> and it was not an historical mm -hmm. idea. It was part of the story. And, and to me, that's the greatest part of it. Uh, Stephen King says that you should and I know you're a very structural writer, which is good, especially mm -hmm. for a new writer. They should probably do it the way you do, with careful outline and stuff. Well, I have to because it's a mystery. <clears throat> well, maybe I don't have to, but <clears throat> I do. <laughs> well, King, of course, he's a genius, mm -hmm. but he said he just likes to splatter around a lot of characters and see where they take the story and see how they create the story. Um, this story, I didn't have the, this whole thing thought out. I had a, an idea of what was going to happen, but um, about midway through, I hit, um, I guess what every writer hates, a big plot hole. Yes. Oh my goodness, how am I gonna get out of this? Yes. <laughs> I, I dug myself into a hole and I said, if I don't dig myself out, this, this story stops right here. I went into my library and I laid down. I didn't nap. I, I just laid down, I closed my eyes, and I must have been there for 45 minutes or an hour, and just constantly rehashing this problem in my head. And finally, I got the idea. I got the solution. So I had to do a little rewriting, and it took off from there. I was able to complete the book. <clears throat> I find that also is that I know what the end point should be. <clears throat> even, even within a chapter, I know where I want to take the chapter, because in writing mysteries for kids, probably this is true for adults as well, I'm, I'm sure it is, that each chapter has to leave you with a feeling of, I must read the next chapter. Mm. <clears throat> you know, I mean, I've done that when, you, you know, when you're reading a book at night, and you <clears throat> say, all right, I'm only going to read to the end of the chapter, and then the end of the chapter is so compelling that you're up all night reading this book. <clears throat> um, yeah, little I, did he know that. Yes, uh -oh. yes. <laughs> and, and so what I, what I do to solve that, because I had to do that with my third book, the one, I'm just sending it the manuscript to the publisher tomorrow. But I, I had a lot of that, a lot of these plot holes where, what? This makes no sense. <clears throat> you know, I got to the end of the chapter, but how did I get there? So then I had to go back and I had to figure out, that's where the structure comes in. I had to figure out how to get there. Mm -hmm. So that was, that's was that been the biggest challenge for me writing. Well, it's, what's been your biggest challenge? Well, the characters, um a good part of it. That's why I tried to make the characters as as believable and realistic as possible, and I did a lot of that just by paying attention to the characters, and getting within, wrapping the character around myself. I mean, it took me uh, over a year to write this uh, book, and for a better part of a year, I was a um, beautiful young African American woman. <laughs> So, you know, not, not, not an aging I was white gonna, guy. I was going to ask you about that, uh, how, you know, I, I often wonder about how a man, you know, a, a 
a male writer gets into the head of a female character. <clears throat> uh, that was interesting. I just did. I, I, I like and respected Ashley Patterson so much that I, I could really get into her head. And the, her, um, I'll just leave it at this, her love interest, I don't want to spoil it, no. um, but uh, she does start to fall in love with a uh, junior officer um, who was uh, in civilian life was a Pulitzer Prize winning author. And so I identified, I have not won a Pulitzer Prize, but I identified a lot with this guy. <laughs> but you wouldn't and, mind if you did. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't turn it down. So the interaction between the two of these people, and also the interaction between Ashley Patterson and the ship's chaplain, who was patterned after a very good friend of mine. Um, ship's chaplain is an uh, Episcopal priest. Ash Ashley is an Episcopalian. And they have a very close relationship of friendship. They had known each other before she took command of the California and um, they, they become very good friends and he really is her spiritual mentor. Um, there is some real spirituality in this book. Um, uh, Ashley can be foul mouthed at times. Uh, good I guess, for her. Like any, any uh, <laughs> uh, seasoned person. Uh, Navy person. <laughs> uh, but she has a deep abiding faith in God and um, uh, the chaplain tries to talk her out of changing history and points out, and again, the fun part of time travel is what happens if you change history? And what happens if you go back, you've changed history, and then you go back to where you came from? Is it going to be the same? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. it can't be the same. Well, that's always the question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that, was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Now, did you have a secret weapon of a, a woman in your life who possibly read, you know, read your book and, and told you when Ashley was really being a woman or when she was really thinking like a man? Linda um, was not my, not this Linda. But. No, right, Lin, Linda with a Y. Linda my, with a Y. My <laughs> wife of many years. Um, she um, vetted this book heavily. Uh, we both realize that my next novel, uh, she's not going to turn her attention to it until I'm finished. Uh, the manuscript is finished, and I've gone through mm -hmm. a few rewrites. But she would go through chapter by chapter, and she was looking at it disjointedly. But she did have a tremendous amount of advice uh, for me. Um, uh, up till the very final rewrite, um, she had some uh, just invaluable uh, input into the thing. Like, she wouldn't do that. No, why not? And, you know, yes. stuff like that. Yeah. That was really invaluable. Yeah. I, could, <clears throat> I think that's really important. I think that men who successfully, I'm probably making a very generalized statement, but men who successfully portray a woman character and vice versa, women who do <clears throat> men, ha have to have a, a deep abiding, uh, at least understanding and respect for the opposite sex to be able to get <clears throat> into their head and do it successfully. Mm -hmm. So. The, the Time Traveler's Wife is a good example of that because yeah. um, one, a very interesting book that you would be written in the first person from the guy's point of view and then from his wife's point of view mm -hmm. as they were children and mm -hmm. very interesting, very interesting. And uh, <clears throat> Now how, how did you publish the book? Um, well, I've been a publisher most of my life. Uh, I used to own a legal publishing company. And um, so when I first got into the idea of publishing, I said, well, okay, I'm a publisher. I kind of know, I didn't know much about book publishing, mm -hmm. but I said, I, I, I do know about the process. I've been an editor, um, seldom my own editor. Um, I had other people, I, I would edit for content. Um, and so I decided I can either go crazy and try to find an agent and sending out all of these letters and then you wait and you, my favorite, and I did that for a while, my favorite response from an agent, because a lot of them like email, naturally, these days, and um, I hit send, not 30 seconds later, a very polite, thorough response. Thank you, we have reviewed your proposal and we are not uh, interested at in this time. <laughs> So it was an autoresponder rejection letter. Well, my favorite is, is I didn't really read your book, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah. said, well, thanks. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Yeah. I, I wonder also if it's a function of being older, already having had a successful career, and then going into book writing and then just not wanting to deal with um, 
stuff that, that um, is going to be a negative experience. Let's just